Hello and welcome to Bridging the Divide. Uh, I'd like to take a moment to introduce our panel, uh, starting from the far right. Uh, Natasha Naujax received her PhD in Modern European History from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in 2011. She currently teaches Advanced Placement Level Modern European and US History at Norfolk Academy in uh, Southeastern Virginia. It's a preparatory academy. Uh, next is Rebecca Marshall. Uh, Rebecca Marshall is a visiting assistant professor at Franklin Marshall College. She uh, recently designed and implemented a history pedagogy training uh, program for 25 PhD students at Northwestern University. Uh, she teaches modern US history. And next is Stephanie, Stephanie Bator, uh, earned a PhD in American history with a focus on uh, US world and gender uh, history, writing a dissertation on um, uh, empire in the Philippines uh, from uh, 1898 to 1946. Uh, she received her PhD from Northwestern in 2012 uh, and is now currently at Lake Forest Academy in uh, Lake Forest, Illinois, private boarding school with uh, 430 students, 49% non-white, 25% international. Uh, she teaches freshman world history, uh, junior U.S. history, and senior electives, uh, all while living in a dorm that houses 38 boys between the ages of 14 and 18. That, that is something. Uh, <clears throat> Megan Roberts, uh, right next to me here, teaches early modern European history at Bowdoin College, uh, and she also received her PhD from Northwestern University. Uh, and this should be an exciting panel, so I'm looking forward to the discussion. Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for coming at uh, this, this Monday, Monday late time slot. Um, so the bridge project that we're going to talk about today began with a discussion that we had at last year's AHA annual meeting. Uh, several of us attended teaching panels, and we wanted to join the conversation about what we as history teachers do and how we might do it better. So as part of that interest, we realized that we had many questions about what our colleagues did on the other side of the high school college divide. So how can we as history teachers uh, at the high school level, for example, ensure that we are sending students to college with the set of skills that their professors expect? Uh, and how can we as history professors be mindful about building on the skills and knowledge that our students arrive with? And when we find ourselves imagining what is going on in classrooms on the other side of the divide, do we have evidence or are we making assumptions? Um, so we proposed making a blueprint to begin exploring some of these questions. Um, we thought that a comprehensive outline for teaching history from the first year high school college freshman experience to, or high school uh, freshman experience to the college capstone course, that a blueprint would ground our conversation in specifics. Um, in doing so, we hope to improve communication and understanding across the divide. So we spent the last year having conversations over Skype and using Google Docs uh, to create this blueprint that we're going to share with you today. So why the Bridge Project? Why do this, right? We acknowledge that there are many productive conversations going on among high school and college teachers. And the recent adoption of AP standards that stress historical habits of mind suggests that there's starting to be um, even more convergence at the high school and college level about what makes good history teaching. So why a, bridge, why a Bridge Project and why might we be the group of teachers to present it? Um, first questions first, we saw a need for a bridge project in the context of declining institutional resources that promote cooperation among high school and college teachers. Uh, the Department of Education's Teaching American History Grants, for example, built many partnerships um, that, uh, that cross the divide by connecting higher ed institutions to K through 12 teachers, but those grants disappeared in 2011. Um, so in our current climate with these and other institutional resources weakening, we thought that we should find ways to support bridged relationships independently. And we thought that our model, um, colleagues meeting remotely with the help of technology like Skype and Google Drive, uh, might suggest a transferable model that any group of history teachers could use to build and sustain relationships that would cross the divide. Um, another reason we created the project was to, dry, to try to ground our conversations about pedagogy and specifics. 
Um, so at the, at the end of many teaching panels, we often find ourselves eager to learn more about what some of the colleagues in the room do in their classrooms. Um, so what do we mean when we say we teach primary source analysis to freshmen in high school, for example? Um, what is our goal? What activities and assignments do we use to accomplish that goal? And how does that goal compare with what we might expect students to do with that same primary source in the college capstone? So these kinds of questions drove our conversations over the last year. Um, we hope that we can contribute to the important work being done by a lot of educators by offering some specifics from our own classrooms and then inviting all of you to do the same. Um, and last, why us? Um, we wanted to add our perspective as early career history instructors who belong to already bridged intellectual communities of teachers. Um, each of us presenters here earned a doctorate in history, but we did so in a climate in which many of our peers looked at the realities of the academic job market and questioned whether a career outside the professoriate might better suit our life goals. And so finishing graduate, student, uh, finishing graduate school at the moment that we did uh, means we know many history teachers who chose to work on both sides of the divide. Um, and so we don't want to overstate the uniqueness of our generation's experience, but we do want to celebrate it. Our conversations drove home the value that different perspectives um, come from teaching at different levels. And as we'll explain later in the presentation, the project convinced us that while high school and college history teachers have many goals in common, we also have a great deal to learn from each other, which we found was really exciting. Um, and lastly, we want to acknowledge that with our group limited to four history instructors, many perspectives were, of course, not included in our conversations. Uh, we hope they will be added here. Um, over the course of our meetings, we became increasingly excited to get to New York and open these conversations to a wider audience. So we're really excited that you're here today. Um, and we're especially hoping to hear from high school teachers who are teaching historical habits of mind while also having to meet demands for um, external requirements such as state education uh, standards. And so welcome. Um, and with that being said, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Natasha. Thank you. So what we'd like to do is open up that conversation right now because um, we really would like to hear other perspectives. So if you currently teach high school, could you raise your hand, please? Okay. Um, what we'd like to do is ask the high school teachers to get together and those of you who are currently teaching at the college level to get together. So maybe shift around to the different sides of the room where you can speak to someone else. And we'd like you to consider the following question. Um, what do you think a typical day looks like in the other cohorts classroom? So if you teach high school, what is going on in the college classroom? And if you teach college, what is going on in a high school classroom? So if you could take a few moments to do that, and then we'll invite you to share those thoughts with us. And if you, be if you belong to neither of those groups, if you could get together and perhaps think about your experiences in either a high school or in a college classroom and what you've experienced there, we'd love to hear that from a, that perspective. Best practices, we're moving. <laughs> Uh, I teach at City College of San Francisco, and I teach U.S. Women's History, and I teach the um, second half of the traditional college transfer U.S. History course from Civil War up to the present. Um, lots of things go on in my classroom. <laughs> um, I struggle with uh, incredible range of students to which I'm supposed to be teaching. From University of California, Berkeley, uh, to those who literally have come into the country one or two days ago, I'm not exaggerating. So uh, I try a number of different techniques uh, to get students interested in the subject matter, uh, small groups, uh, pretty traditional films. I do lecture. Uh, I'm finding that I'm spending a lot more time explaining uh, just almost anything to students. I encourage them to ask questions so that they understand what's going on. Um, but I think one of my greatest challenges, and there are many, is reading and getting students to read. And um, I mean, we are <laughs> in the process of, uh, for example, tenure review of some faculty, new faculty, who aren't even requiring any reading in their classes. 
And this is of deep concern to me. And I would love to hear anybody's feedback on this issue. <laughs> Thank you. Thank Can you. We, so I was wondering, if uh, maybe I'll turn to this group next, and if you could comment on what your group thought high school teachers were up to in their, in their classrooms. Um, to a certain degree, we thought it was a black box from the, coming from the college perspective. I mean, we can reflect upon our own experiences. And I think we agreed that depending on where the student's coming from, different students in the same college class can come from very different perspectives. I know in my own high school career, several years back now, um, just within the same public high school, I had classes which were wonderful, which were more on the college uh, model of sh uh, assigned readings, discussions in class, short papers, also longer tests, sometimes Scantron tests, but um, closer to the college model. And I also had classes where you show up you read a chapter from the textbook in class, you take, you work on a worksheet that's generated by the textbook company, and my professor read the newspaper the entire 50 minutes of that particular <laughs> class. So depending on what classes they're taking from different schools, we recognize they're coming from very different perspectives, which might teach them, hopefully, rote learning, which might begin to teach them critical thinking, but there's a very good chance that that's not the case. And I do know that at least textbook publishers are now pitching all-inclusive packages where you buy the textbook, you uh, assign to your high school and college students, I should say, to watch these little videos online, to take the test that the textbook company provides. Mm -hmm. So without knowing what actual high school teachers do, I know that there's very much the possibility for them to just ingest what the textbook companies are putting out there. And from what I've seen, sometimes that's of okay quality and sometimes it's less so. Thank you. Okay, so sort of a wide range of possibilities there. Uh, can we hear from the high school teachers? Well, uh, we're probably sending you pretty ill-prepared students. That's what we're doing. And I suspect that because of the number of adjuncts who are teaching lower level courses or introductory courses, that you probably have 400 people in your class. Uh, you have a discussion, you give assignments, you probably show a lot of films, and there's really no, no time to really discuss things because students are coming in and they're not history majors, they're not interested, and you're probably just getting by because you've got to run to your other assignment across town because you're not full, you're not full time at the, the institution that, you're, that you find yourself in. Um, I'm hoping that you have seen or will be seeing a lot more prepared students. Now granted, I teach at a school that well, it's pretty, elite, or I wouldn't call it elite, but certainly cha more challenging, Brooklyn Tech High School. And uh, we sort of force AP classes down our kids' throats. Mm -hmm. And as a result, even though some may rise to the challenge and others won't, at least they will be prepared or at least seen, get a little glimpse of what college life or college academic life is going to be. So uh, again, I can't speak from the ordinary neighborhood high school, but certainly most of my students are like 99% of them are going off to college. And I think that they're a lot better prepared than the average neighborhood high school student. Thank you. So it sounds like both groups are mindful of some of the market and institutional pressures that might be creating challenges for the other side, but not necessarily having a really concrete everyday sense of what's going on. Okay, so what was really exciting about this project, um, which we didn't expect, I, mean, I don't know, I think we all expected it would be fun, but it was amazingly stimulating to get together once a month via Skype and just talk about teaching and to talk about it across levels. And um, what we found is that the four of us actually have way more in common than we thought. 
Um, and so, if, Natasha, if you could hit the next slide. So what we found, in terms of what we found, what we try to do in common, now this is our ideal of what we would like to do. This doesn't always happen. Um, but our goals in the classroom are that we all see history as rooted in, it's a discipline rooted in questions. Um, but th one of the differences between us would be how we um, sort of work with those questions at different levels. At the high school level, we agreed that we're teaching students how to ask them and to develop that skill, whereas at college, you're getting them to think more deeper and more critically and to ask uh, better questions, stronger, deeper questions. Um, all of us think that primary and secondary sources are important, um, but a lot of us struggled um, actually with how do you teach historiography um, at any level. Mm -hmm. um, so that was something that came up, but that we all saw as a goal to make primary and secondary source reading really central to the classroom. And, and fundamentally, we want our students to be able to persuasively articulate arguments, whether that's written or orally. Um, and so, and those are difficult things. It, it's hard to teach students to um, verbally explain their thoughts in a coherent manner, and it's hard to teach them how to do that in written format. Uh, and so those are some three major goals that we see in our classroom. As far as historical skills, um, we are all teaching this list, or we're trying to. Um, where we are at the teaching levels um, it is gonna sort of shift our focus on what we're looking at more. So for instance, when I'm working with my freshmen in high school, I'm working more at the top of the list. That cause and effect continuity and change over time. Once I get to my juniors, I'm working further down the list, a, a lot more emphasis, and in college definitely we're, um, we're emphasizing a lot at the bottom there. But in general, in all, we're trying to emphasize these skills at some way, shape, or form across all levels of the classroom. Uh, and so what was really fun about our conversations, well, I think, I don't know, like uh, Natasha and I often talk that like, when we started, when we went into high school teaching, we thought that what, I don't know, at least I did, we thought was, what I was gonna do was gonna be really different. Mm -hmm. It's not. Um, it's just, it's different in the way I implement it, and the challenges that I face are different, but strikingly, all of us were like, oh yeah, we all, we all wanna do that. So it was refreshing and cool, because there often is this, this conception that there's this huge difference and gulf between us, um, but there wasn't. Yeah. Um, so we were really excited about the common ground, but of course there, there are differences. Um, and so we want to ask you um, again to converse with each other and, and consider this question kind of a follow-up question to the first one. What do you think are the biggest differences between your teaching and the teaching that goes on in, in the other cohort. So if you are a high school teacher, again, if you could consider what do you think are the biggest differences between your classroom and a college classroom and, and vice versa. Um, and then we'd love to hear your thoughts again. And if you fit again into neither of those categories, from your own experience in those two levels, what did you experience as a student the key differences as? Because we'd also love to hear that. But, uh, we, we do have lots of opportunity for discussion, so I'm going to go ahead and say we should come together as a session now uh, and just share some of, the, of what you were thinking in your group about the differences between high school teaching and college teaching. So I thought I would start with this group over here. Uh, do you have a volunteer for the microphone? I don't know if I can reach that far, so you might have to come to me. Um, hi. Um, I'm Lane. Uh, I'm a college freshman at Vassar. I think I come from a very different background than anybody else here because I went to high school in China, and I only came to the States four months ago. I'm taking a, I took a, a U.S. history course. It's a freshman seminar, so it was like, like uh, on, there are only 17 people. And um, the thing I realized after I came to the States was like, as I thought of, as I thought back, I mean, my high school like history courses, I realized there was really very little mention of historical methods. I mean, in my high school history classes, the teachers just told us like entertaining stories about historical figures, and we would use like an outline that he gave us. It was mostly cause and effect, and he would just give us the um, the conclusions that we have to memorize for the test. It was basically basically test oriented. And it was after in college that, well, one of the um, eye-opening experience for me is that we started to look at the, um, the ongoing like uh, relationship and conversations that different sources might have with each other that we might not realize before, that texts that come from like two vastly different time periods actually have some commonalities that we can explore that they actually share a common theme, that there's some kind of thematic 
um, significance that we can discuss further. So that's really like very different for me because yeah, as I thought back, well, high school history class, we all, we like, we felt like we had the best history teacher ever, I mean, high school, but now as I realized, well, yeah. Yeah. Um, being almost done, kind of in between, I'm student, being my, doing my student teaching in the, the spring semester, so I'm kind of all done with doing, like, actual college classes, undergrad classes, going into the teaching profession. I, like, we have to take, like, courses on teaching the students both how to read, like, as, like, just reading, and then in the context, like, of history and other thoughts. And then um, I, we, we mentioned, and I mentioned that it, I'm, like, scared to, like, um, I guess, kind of, to figuring out how to engage, like get my students in, like engaged in the short period of like 14 weeks that I that I'm going to be involved with them. So like I'm obviously going to be working with my supporting teacher, but it's like how do I do all of this stuff when I feel that I didn't get all of the information that I could to like give them the best kind of education that they. But it's it's going to be a challenge that I'm looking forward to kind of tackling as I'm moving through the semester. Thanks. So do we have volunteers from the groups in the back, perhaps, who want to talk about what, what they think that are the differences between their cohort and the other cohort in the room? You'll have to come to me. I definitely can't go that far. The group on the left is having a really good conversation about Hi, my name is Alex Lichtenstein. I teach history at Indiana University, but I also oversee what's called our uh, advanced college project for U.S. history, i.e. a concurrent or dual enrollment program, where uh, the high schools in Indiana are increasingly essentially taking over the role of teaching college-level history in the high schools. And the students get IU history credit as if they had come to campus or enrolled in, in uh, an IU program uh, and were getting uh, credit for the US survey. So essentially, uh, one of the questions I raised for our cohort is what happens when structurally high school and college begin to converge? Now, I oversee the ACP program, but I'm very disappointed in it. And I'm looking for ways to reform it because I think fundamentally high school and college should and do do different things. And they should be complementary. And we want the students to come from high school to college ready to move down that list. That was very useful. But uh, our problem is, is that uh, there's, there's political and fiscal pressure to converge them. And it's problematic. So I often go and talk to the high school teachers and try and you know, create convergent syllabi expectations, but it's very, very difficult. But one thing that I observe that's positive is the high schools have some advantages. That is, they meet with the students four or five days a week. We see them twice a week. Um, they have much smaller groups, so they can break them into group projects. They can know them and uh, engage them face to face as, as individuals in ways that most of us can't in large survey classes. So I keep telling the high school teachers, uh, even though I don't tell them I you know, I'm, I'm very skeptical of the program, but I do say that they should use the advantages that they have that we don't have to the maximum. And I think most of them do. So, uh, but I am curious if other people have this experience of this kind of structural convergence, which I see as, as actually a, a terrible, terrible thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and not because, you know, I, th I think the high school teachers do a fabulous job, but they should do what they do and we should do what we do. And we need to make them complement each other, but not replicate each other would be my view. Right, so not rushing the development of students along. Uh, anyone from this group care to comment or no? <laughs> yeah, okay. You, you don't have to, if you want to just share what your group was talking about, we can always come back to that as well. So if you. <laughs> Um, <laughs> but we, we sort of talked about, um, in terms of differences, there was a question of autonomy uh, mm -hmm. at, at, when you're teaching at the high school level versus teaching at a university or college level, um, and specifically that you have less of it at the high school level uh, because there's so much uh, 
there's a lot of there's a lot of overseeing that takes place and a lot of right you know requirements and regulations mm -hmm. so, which I think ties into the other thing that we were talking about which was deeper questions mm -hmm. and you said at the university level you have you know you ask the sort of deeper questions and what does that mean and uh, at the high school level do you ask those deeper questions because the students aren't prepared to or do you not ask those deeper questions because there isn't time? Right. Um, because it doesn't fit in with the program. Mm -hmm. AP has some requirements, some uh, a rubric, in fact, I guess, um, and uh, that says, well, here are, here's what we might consider a deeper question. Um, you know, we did. You know, at a panel I I, I attended yesterday, a gentleman delivered world history, AP world history, and was told he had to do it in 15 weeks. And you, I think you were there. <laughs> you were definitely there. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> you chaired it. Um, and it was really quite, um, really quite uh, astounding to hear about that experience. Uh, when can you get to those deeper questions when you have to tick those boxes? Mm -hmm. So that was sort of. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. It was really gratifying for me at least to, to hear your thoughts because I heard so much resonance with our own conversations and I think that um, you know that gives us some hope that we're doing something really useful here and that the conversation that we're having is, is going on elsewhere. Um, we also discussed our, our differences and I think one thing we all agreed on is that first and foremost our differences as teachers are driven by the differences in our students. Um, you know, on the surface, there may not look like that much of a difference between a 16-year-old and an 18-year-old, but with that difference in age comes an often significant difference in their cognitive abilities, and that shapes what we can expect from them in terms of their ability to exercise independence of thought, their ability to handle um, nuance and ambiguities, and also, quite simply, the workload that we can expect from them at, at different levels. Um, also, the the role that they expect us to play in their lives and the way we interact with them in the classroom changes as they mature. Um, but of course, we also have differences because we, we do have different strengths at different levels. Right, and so one of the things that uh, is, is clearly a difference across the board to, to paint with very broad strokes is that high school teachers tend to have more pedagogical training. A lot of them might have education degrees uh, as well as a history degree. Uh, and so they tend to, to, to be quite up to date on, on pedagogical research, to, to really think quite critically about that, and to engage in continuing education programs. Uh, so that there is structurally a lot of incentive for high school teachers to really uh, follow that particular line of research. College teachers can also be up to date on pedagogical research, but they're not as incentivized to do so, and many people just choose to stay with what they know uh, and what they feel is working for them. So it's a bit more of a sort of hands-on figuring things out, uh, not quite as in touch with what is going on in, actual, the, in the actual education field of research. Uh, but that said, college teachers are very much incentivized to, to keep up with their own fields of research, to stay up to date on historical literature, and to engage in research themselves. Uh, so whereas high school teachers are a great resource for college teachers because they are so up to date on pedagogical ideas, college teachers are a great resource for high school teachers because they can help them uh, make sure that what's going on in their classrooms really resonates with the latest historical thinking. Uh, so that once again, even though we have different differences and we have different strengths, they're very much complementary and when you put the two groups in conversation with each other, really good things can come out of it. Oh, can go to the next slide. Okay, so to keep, to keep the microphone in my hand, um, one, as, we, as Rebecca mentioned at the very beginning of the panel, one of our goals here was to create a blueprint. So what, in our ideal world, would it look like to craft a history education from someone's first year in high school to their last year in college? What would we see as the ideal progression? And just to reiterate some of what Stephanie was saying as the, the goals that we keep in mind uh, when we were crafting this blueprint, we wanted to cultivate, as Rebecca put it, history brains. So we want students who are thinking of ours as a discipline that asks questions. So to make sure that at no point do they think that history is about just memorizing what we say and they regurgitate it back to us. That history is about finding questions to ask, finding sources that help you answer those questions, and being very mindful about the limitations of those sources and the questions that you're asking. 
This also involves cultivating historical empathy, so making sure that students at all levels think of the past as a very different place. Uh, so to try and combat against presentism in our students at every level. We also agree that the goal for everyone should be uh, encouraging independence of thought amongst all of our students. So that looks very different at different levels, uh, but that we all want our students to start working towards asking their own questions, finding their own sources, uh, and really thinking on their own about what has happened in the past and how it continues to resonate in the present. So those were our goals. Um, okay, so this is the actual blueprint, and I should say that uh, we have a very extensive discussion of the blueprint on our blog, uh, which we have developed in, 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 as part of this project. So you can see the, the whole blueprint here. I'm going to butcher it by trying to summarize it very, very quickly for you. Uh, but if you're interested in the fuller explanation of our ideas, they are right here on the blog for you. Okay, so one of the key things that we thought uh, about high school education in history is that it needed to be highly vertical. So that you start small with a freshman student in high school. You assign primary sources, but you only assign one primary source at a time. Uh, you then go over that primary source quite extensively with them, model the kinds of questions that you can ask with that primary source, and have them think really critically about how and why that source was produced. Uh, so somewhat surprisingly, uh, we all felt that it was okay to use textbooks at the uh, high school level. This might not resonate with everyone in the audience, but we felt that textbooks were actually a really good way to have students learn context, um, and especially to have them think about how you consume large amounts of information and get through and, and actually retain some of it. So it's a kind of information management skill uh, that you're teaching with textbooks. That said, you do not want to just hand your students a textbook and have them think that this is some sort of perfect representation of the past. So that we really encourage uh, teachers to provide critical reading questions to accompany both primary sources and the textbook so that students think of both as sources that require interpretation and careful thought. Now, uh, all of that you can start to do with your freshmen in high school. So we don't want, uh, just because freshmen need more scaffolding, more hand-holding, we don't want anyone to think that we recommend that freshmen just be talked at. We think that even at that early stage, you should start trying to cultivate some historical thinking skills. And at the sophomore level, you can really start to step things up. You can begin to teach research skills. Uh, so start introducing them to historical databases, start introducing them to historical scholarship, start having them think about historiography a little bit, uh, and continue to step that up. Like I said, it's highly vertical. Uh, so in the junior and senior years, start assigning research papers uh, of varying length. So the juniors have a smaller research paper that they, that they tackle, and the seniors have a pretty substantial one. So that's, that's a very brief summary of what we came up for the high school years. In college, we, we were somewhat different in terms of thinking about verticality. Here we saw a key divide not between each year, but between first year college students and everyone else. So that you can uh, approach sophomores and seniors uh, in a much more similar way than you can first years and sophomores, or certainly first years and juniors. So for first years, we again recommend lots of scaffolding. Um, and this, again, since this is our ideal world where we don't have to worry about administrative or political pressures, uh, we decided that the ideal class for first year students would be a small class, perhaps capped at 15 students, and it would involve a lot of discussion. So that would be the main uh, way that students are, are, are learning in that class. So you would provide them with a lot of discussion questions, you would model what, uh, what kinds of questions are good to ask to get them to move away from the, as Rebecca put it, why did FDR wear blue socks kind of question to really thinking about questions <laughs> of deep historical significance and really expanding what they think of as significant. It doesn't have to just be politics with a capital P. Mm -hmm. uh, we also recommend frequent writing assignments, especially for first years. Have them start writing early, have them start writing often, give them opportunity for low stakes writing so that they don't feel like if they mess up their first writing assignment in college that they are therefore doomed to a life of failure. Um, and along those same lines, provide first year students with opportunities for revision so that they can learn from the feedback that you give them and, and really grow as writers. Now for more advanced students, um, 
and there will be progression from the sophomore through senior years, but even at the sophomore level, uh, start, start really working towards more independence in discussion, in research, uh, and in writing. So start thinking about letting your students take over class discussions. Ask them to come up with the questions instead of bringing them in yourself. Uh, have them design their own research papers rather than you giving them a prompt and a specific source. Um, ask them to really critique each other's writing with peer review. So to have the students increasingly take control of their own educations. Uh, so those are, those are the very brief summaries of our blueprint that we came up with. But again, I encourage you to really look at the full blueprint on the blog. It's much more sophisticated than what I'm uh, actually able to do justice here. And also, we would love to have your comments on the blueprint. It's, as it's titled on the blog, this is our first go at the blueprint. We are in no way pretending that we have solved all of the problems associated with history education or that our perspective is so perfect that there is, there's no need for revision. So we would love to hear your thoughts on what we've written. Thank you. So the, the general progression of our, our Skype conversations um, we spent a lot of time kind of discussing the challenges that we commonly confronted um, in, our, in our classrooms and then being the good problem solvers that we are, we talked about some of the solutions that we've come up with to meet those challenges. Um, and I think I can speak for all of us, this was maybe the most fruitful part of our discussions. I, you know, I say all the time, I get my best ideas as a teacher by observing what other teachers do in their classrooms or hearing what they do in their classrooms. Um, so what we just wanted to do now is to take a few minutes um, and share with you some of our best practices. And again, they are by no means perfect, but I think these are some of the things that have, have given us success in meeting those challenges in our classrooms. Um, my, my the, the course that I teach most often and that I have the most students in, in my, at my school is um, Modern European History. And it is a 10th grade class, and I should note that at my school, 10th grade is the first year of high school, so they are kind of like freshmen in a lot of ways. Um, and my primary objective in that class is to challenge my students' understanding of what capital H history, history as a discipline is. Um, and their general consensus at the beginning of the year invariably is that history is synonymous with the past. Um, whereas we, of course, want them to see it as an argument about the past, right, constituted by logical interpretations of historical evidence. And we do this, of course, not only by modeling historical argumentation for them, but by also giving them the opportunity to make their own arguments about the past, usually in the form of an essay. And I find that with my 10th graders, this is a kind of writing that they are largely unfamiliar with. They're very good at expository writing, but probably haven't done argumentative writing before. Um, so I find myself having to teach it, which I am not trained to teach writing. Um, but what I've discovered is that a, an in-class workshop model works really well for introducing them to this as a process, partly because they find it less intimidating but I've also found that if we can collaborate on the content of the first essay and sort of come up with an answer collectively, then on an individual level, I can focus my feedback on their structure and their mechanics so that they can sort of quickly master the formula of what an essay looks like. And then we can spend the rest of the year really working on developing their analytical skills. So um, in this workshop, I start, I, I give them a prompt. This is a typical prompt that I would start with, and then I present them with a six-step process for essay writing. And we do steps one through four collectively in class as, as group work. Um, I divide the class into groups of about four to five students. And each group starts by spending about 20 minutes just brainstorming and thinking of everything that we learned over the unit that could possibly used, be used in, uh, to answer this essay question. And I like to have my students use um, shared Google Docs. If you have this technology available, it's great because this allows several people to collaborate on a document at the same time so they all feel like they're contributing, but also I can monitor their progress and sort of jump in where necessary. Um, each group then shares its ideas with the rest of the class and I chart them on the board. And I think this is a really important step just sort of as formative assessment because it gives me a chance to clarify any misunderstandings about the material and sort of guide them if necessary. And then after we review the basics of paragraph organization, which they've, they've learned in their English classes, um, each group starts a new shared Google Doc where they actually draft an outline for the essay. I give them a template. They write a working thesis, they write topic sentences, and then they create bullet points of the evidence that they will use for each paragraph. And so what we have in a typical class will end up with four different outlines, and I'll project them all up on the board so that we can compare them. And I find that exercise really key because um, 
you know, one thing with high school students that we're always trying to fight is the tyranny of the right answer. They think there is one single right answer. And by looking at four different outlines, which are almost always all viable, they see that that's really not the case. Um, and I try to stay out of the conversation as much as possible at this point and give them a chance to critique each other's work and to give each other feedback. Um, and then finally, using the outline that they created in class, they then complete steps five and six individually. So most of this is a shared, collective, mutual response, mutually responsible effort. Um, and like I said, this gives me a chance to really focus my feedback on the mechanics and the structure of the essay, and I usually just use a really simple rubric to grade it and say, it, with criteria, say, good job, this needs work, and I find that that encourages them to kind of focus on the areas that require improvement when they're doing their revisions. Um, another challenge that I find with my 10th graders especially is mastering chronological order. <laughs> they find this incredibly overwhelming. Their default, of course, is to just try to memorize dates. Um, but they become really overwhelmed when we're dealing with really complex events where events unfold in, in, in um, rapid succession. And so I've started using Twitter simulations um, as an in-class exercise in which students live tweet the past, speaking from the perspective of historical actors, but using modern language um, to inform sort of an imagined global public about what was going on. And I think this kind of exercise has multiple benefits. First of all, because students do have to date their tweets, it does help them establish causality and other connections between events. But it also encourages them to develop that historical empathy that we were talking about, because it encourages them to view and speak about the past from the perspective of those historical actors through those lenses rather than their own. And the reason I think this works really well is because by translating history through a medium that is so familiar to them and something that so many of them use every day, I mean, I have some real master tweeters in my classes, um, it helps students bridge that gap between what can sometimes seem like a very foreign and incomprehensible past and the present. It really seems to make sense for them. And for me, it has a lot of value as a formative assessment tool, again, because it helps me clear up those trouble spots, right? The things that are really challenging about revolutionary history that I might not recognize before we get to a unit test. Um, and I also think this is a really versatile exercise. Like I said, I use it primarily as a chronological aid, but I could see someone also using this um, for an historiographical assignment where students tweet the, the differing perspectives of historians with, with, with opposing arguments. Um, and for those of you who don't tweet, this it really is remarkably simple to do. I've done it using pen and paper. You can have them set up dumb, dummy Twitter accounts. There's even um, a website that runs historical Twitter simulations called twistery.org. It's really, really fantastic. Thank you, Natasha. Okay, so um, one of the things that I try to do in terms of cultivating historical empathy is to use some role-playing games, because I feel strongly that history classes can be fun as well as educational at the same time, um, and role-playing really helps students cultivate historical empathy. I mean, they quite obviously have to put themselves in somebody else's shoes and think from their perspective, not from their own presentist perspective. Uh, I've also found that when it's a role-playing game and students are doing something that's so out of what the, the usual and is really fun, that they get really invested in it in a way that, you know, I just don't tend to see if I'm running your standard lecture and discussion kind of day. Uh, so they'll, they'll do really creative things and will actually spend a lot of time outside of class strategizing with their, their allies about how they're going to succeed in the next challenge that they might face. Um, role playing, especially if you don't control it too closely and you just sort of let events play out, also is great for highlighting the contingency of the past. You don't have to let the, the events unfold in exactly the same manner in the class as they did in the past, and then you can have a useful conversation about why there were differences. So instead of making it seem like the French Revolution progressed this way because it had to, you can start talking about the larger historical forces that were influencing actors, but also how you know Louis the Sixteenth's somewhat lackluster personality didn't help the cause. So um, that's that's one of the the, the games I like to use. Uh, and just the one I think that was has been most successful for me is the French Revolution. Um, and so the way that that works is that I 
It, it's a multi-week game, so it's a pretty intense investment on the instructor's part. Students are assigned different factions in the National Assembly, and they have to uh, meet as an assembly and discuss various issues of the time and figure out what they're going to do with the Constitution. So they actually have to vote on issues about the clergy, about what's going on with slaves in Saint-Domingue, that sort of thing. Um, I like this because the first time I taught the French Revolution, I found that students tended to revert to a kind of moral judgment mode. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the terror was terrible. They shouldn't have killed people. Uh, these revolutionaries were just bad people. You know, what was the matter with them? Robespierre was, it one, as one of my sp students put it, obviously rotting in hell. Um, <laughs> which, you know, as a historian, maybe, maybe that's how you feel as an individual, but that's not what we do as a discipline. You know, we don't just all have the Robespierre hater club. Um, and so instead, I was really trying to push them, like, okay, but why were they executing people? Why are they using the guillotine? Why are they talking about politics in this way? And it was just hard for them to, you know, just say, like, well, they were wrong, so they shouldn't have been. When they were role-playing, on the other hand, there was a lot more understanding that, you know, things, things were tough for, for Robespierre and his, his guys, that they, they had goals they wanted to accomplish, and they were being thwarted by all these forces, that, you know, they'd read their Rousseau, they knew what they were supposed to think about, you know, ideological purity, that kind of thing. So that there was a lot more understanding of the forces that were shaping these historical actors, not just a sort of who was good, who was bad. Now, one component of the role-playing game that I found especially successful, and I think you could use this without having to do an extensive exercise, was that the students had to write newspapers for their factions. So they, would, uh, they, they were entirely student-designed. They decided what issues were most important for them to highlight for their faction, um, and they would just write articles that were intended to persuade the other factions to see things their way. Um, this was great not only from the perspective of cultivating historical empathy, but from a, 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 the perspective of teaching writing. It was just a very different way of writing for students. They had a lot more fun doing it than they do when I give them a primary source and tell them to write an analysis of it. Uh, so they were, again, more invested in making it be a good piece of writing. Um, and I found that these were some of the best pieces of student writing that I'd ever read. Uh, they, were, they were just very invested in finding a persuasive argument, finding evidence to support it, and thinking really carefully about how to craft that argument. Okay, so moving on to a very different example, um, if you think about our blueprint in terms of cultivating independence in our students and how you want to progress to letting students really take control of their educations, um, in my capstone seminars, so the advanced seminars, which are mostly senior history majors, I actually have students teach around 45 to 60 minutes of a seminar. So they are all designing research papers. Uh, they all have been working on them for several weeks at this point, and they take over class. So they'll actually assign reading to their peers. They will come up with uh, any sort of clips they wanna share in class, any primary sources they wanna bring with them. Uh, if they wanna give a small lecture, they give a lecture. Um, and this, I find, is very useful on a number of fronts. First of all, it encourages students to think carefully about their own research, because as we all know, if you don't know it, you can't teach it. So they, they, de they definitely get to know their own stuff quite well. It also helps them cultivate their oral communication skills, which I think is something that a lot of us could be doing more of in our classes, uh, because that's part of the assignment. They have to present their ideas engagingly. Uh, they can't just drone on about what they've discovered. They have to try and make sure that people learn something. Um, and then finally, it's useful for their peers to get this kind of insider look at what their, uh, what their fellow students are doing with their research projects. I, I think historical research can often feel very isolating and you feel like the problems that you're having are just because you're not quite good at it. Uh, but if you see that your peers are grappling with similar difficulties and that you get to see what strategies they're using to overcome those difficulties, it pays off for everyone's research project to have that kind of assignment. Uh, and so then, just very quickly, I'll mention the one last thing I do. Uh, I do this at every level, so this starts at the first year and I continue doing it as seniors, is to make sure that students are processing information and are grasping historical arguments. I have them write 150 word summaries of the reading, which they hate doing, so I'm not saying that this is like the role playing game and they actually have fun doing this, uh, but it teaches them to really have to distill another historian's argument 
into a very concise statement, and it also helps them to identify problems with their prose. If they are inclined to write very wordy sentences, if they have a hard time saying things quickly, uh, that is, this is a very low stakes assignment where we can both sort of see that they're having a problem with that and prevent it from being a problem with their more, uh, their longer and, and more heavily graded assignments. Okay. Uh, okay, so the first activity I wanted to share uh, with you all today was uh, was the fishbowl, and this might be something that some of you are familiar with in the audience, but um, in the blueprint, this exercise fits in for um, first-year college students, but it's extremely flexible, which is one of the reasons I like it. Um, the, the goal for me in this activity is usually to practice historical habits of mind through discussion. So the problem I was trying to solve is making sure that discussion was not just getting students to talk for my first year students. Uh, instead, I wanted them to practice thinking in the discipline through discussion. So this exercise allowed me to set the guidelines for discussion, which historical skills I wanted them to practice, uh, but then pull back and let them let them sort of take over the, the conversation. What the instructor needs is four to five learning goals for your class session that are articulated as questions that students have a reasonable amount of knowledge to answer. So that can range from recall to contextualizing primary sources to explaining contingency, and I'll give some sample questions in a second. Um, you need randomly selected student groups. I use their birthdays. You can pull names out of a hat, and you need a timer. Pretty low stakes technology here. So um, this is how it works. So uh, right, I have about five questions. Students get the list of questions and prepare. I say either on their own or in small groups, and I tell them to prioritize whatever questions terrify you the most I have to talk about in front of the whole class. Uh, after they're a little bit ready, the, the fishbowl has rounds um, that correspond to the number of questions that you have prepared. Uh, the fishbowl has a set number of minutes per round, so I usually use five, five minutes in the fishbowl. Um, and then the instructor can add their own rules. And for me, uh, one of the things I wanted my first year students to do was really practice articulating rather than ignoring the gaps in their own knowledge. So I would include um, these kind of phrases, stock phrases that they could use in discussion in order to signal that, such as, I would want to know, fill in the dots. Um, I also made a rule that everyone had to participate at some point in the fishbowl in order for them to not do push-ups once, I'm just kidding, I didn't make them do push-ups. Um, and then after the, after the round, there are two additional minutes on the timer for me and everyone else in the class, the students who are not in the fishbowl, to participate. So for each round, the selected students pull their chairs into the center of the classroom and they talk for the set number of minutes uh, in response to the question. They're on the hot seat, but they're together, so it's a little less terrifying. Um, and so if we go to the next slide, I'll show you what my sample questions were for my first year students. So um, they read a source by Herbert Hoover, and I wanted them to explicitly reflect on their preconceived notions about the guy they know made Hoover bills, right? So what previous ideas did you have about Herbert Hoover, and how did source two confirm, complicate, or challenge those ideas, right? Explicitly uh, addressing preconceived knowledge. The second question, um, what was the New Deal, and what does source four, again, a reference to a source that they read, help us understand about it? So so um, right, this question asks students to do some recall and also to practice contextualizing a primary source. So that was a goal that I wanted my first year students to practice. Um, and the last one, did the New Deal go too far in changing the role of the federal government in American life? Uh, not far enough, just right. So I, I also tried to give my students tools for talking about presentism and hindsight as kinds of conversations they could have about the past and distinguishing those conversations from what we are talking about, the conversations grounded in historical analysis. So this question was geared to ask them to bring in presentism and hindsight in order to discuss the past. Um, so like I said, very flexible. If you can think of four or five questions, uh, and it, it creates a lot of, um, students generate a lot of the information for discussion. Uh, and it doesn't take a lot of work for instructors, which is not that bad. Um, and so that was my first year, um, first year college student uh, contribution. The second one I'm gonna add 
my uh, contribution for the capstone course for college history majors. So like Megan, I was trying to think of how I could get students to do more independent work, um, design their own questions, et cetera. And the problem that I was trying to solve here was the disconnect between my course readings and the research projects that I had assigned for students. It felt like there were always these two things going on in the course and they were very separate and I was trying to figure out how to integrate those. So I was trying to transfer knowledge to students about what it meant to, quote, situate a project within the literature, right? We know what that means as, as historians, but for students it's like, what are you talking about? So that was my goal. So my strategy was to choose a small but manageable selection of the historiography for the course that I taught. It was a course on the American consumer. And so for our course, that meant we had six books. There are six books on the American consumer. Um, I asked students to, we, we read those books and, uh, and discussed them. I asked students to write what I called book breakdowns for, um, for each of the books. So there's more about this on the blog if you want to read further. But basically the goal was that each student would be assigned a different book in our small historiography and they would be responsible for creating a, a sort of breakdown that they shared with the class. That included, um, a, it was a three to five page summary of the book's historical questions, a chapter by chapter outline, a discussion of sources, and a discussion of what the book could not tell us because of its approach. And I wrote the first book breakdown to contribute to our class resource so they understood exactly what it was I was uh, asking them to do. The book breakdowns were always due after we discussed the book and I encouraged students to share their notes so whichever member of our team was working on the breakdown could draw on our collective knowledge. Um, I also built in a research journal but I won't talk about that right now for the sake of time. And so my suggestion for how to integrate this book breakdown stuff with the, the archival work and uh, research they're doing outside of class comes in the next slide which is to build a historiography requirement into their research paper. And so these are the, the questions that I built into the final paper rubric um, that said, is your historiography section a two to four page section that comes immediately after your intro hook and argument? If the answer is no, oh goodness, you're in trouble because it's in the rubric. Um, does your historiography section engage at least four of the six books of scholarship, uh, of works of scholarship on the American consumer that we read in class? Does it include two other books, requiring them to go out and find additional resources that relate to their topic? And does your historiography section engage, oh, I already said that, uh, answer the question, how have historians written about consumerism? And how has, have historians written about consumerism as it relates to your specific topic? Right, so this was a final exam on the books we read in class, but built into the research paper. I have evidence that I think this worked. It's on the next slide. Um, so from, one student paper uh, who was exploring the works we read in class, he said, unlike Leach, who takes a top-down approach in his work, oh goodness, Kathy Pice focuses on working class women in the 20th century and their influence on American culture. Her gender history from the bottom up, this made my heart explode. Uh, and the second quotation is from a student who was writing about the concept of a living wage and focused on the collection from a local labor union. The way he closed up his historiography and introduced his own project looked like this. Overall, these historians have analyzed the rise of consumerism and the effects that this shift has had on the nation's economy and culture. But the rise of a consumer identity has not only empowered buyers, it also emboldened purchasers in the sphere where they earn their paychecks at work. So to me, this was evidence that there was integration of historiography and independent research. Thanks. Okay, so um, for me, I'm gonna share three assignments with you. I teach wildly differing levels at the high school level. I teach freshmen, which is an untracked course. I teach uh, a, the junior level US history, which is a tracked course, it's the general course. And then I teach senior electives, which are also untracked. So I, have, I run into a lot of really interesting challenges um, in the course of the last two and a half years that I started teaching high school. Uh, and one of the biggest one was I was like, I went from teaching seniors in a capstone seminar at a, at a university to teaching freshmen introductory world history. Uh, and it was quite, quite a whiplash. Uh, and so um, one of the big thing that I wanted to solve was, okay, how do I teach how you read primary sources? Um, and what, one of the first critical things that I, I'm working with with my freshmen as they come in is how do you get them to understand and comprehend a primary source? And so what I do is a lot of creative projects. This one I found works really, really well. Um, you basically, the goal of it is to help them learn how to understand a primary source, but to do it in a fun way. 
I give them, uh, so for this project, uh, it was on origin myths because we were studying world religions. And so I went through and read a, a series of origin myths that I then assigned to students based on the level of their, under, um, of their um, ability at that point. I'd sort of been working with the students for a little while and was aware of who, for instance, was an English language learner and might need. And like, it was not a good idea to give them the origin myth that lists all the different fruits and vegetables because that involves a lot of vocab knowledge. <laughs> um, so that's not going to work for them. Or I have the students who are super, super advanced so they can handle the sort of more complex myths. Uh, but the, the goal for it is that they have to write a children's book based on this primary source. Uh, and the, the reason why I do that is because a children's book has to be simple, clear prose. And therefore, the student has to show me that they understand the content of the source. That they, they are able to take, they're reading it, they're putting it into their own words, and they are clearly um, sharing that with me. It doesn't have to be a children's book. Um, oh, some students did pen and paper. Other students did it um, electronically on their iPads. Other students made small videos, like a, a children's um, like TV show. And what we did was we then shared them all with the class. And everybody had a different origin myth. Uh, and then we were able to then compare and contrast all these origin myths, thinking about um, how humans have understood themselves in the world. And I found that something like this, especially for a younger cohort, it's creative, but it also really forces them to think critically and understand. And that, because that first step of teaching primary sources, I think, is about getting students to know what the source is saying. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so next. And this can actually, you can make this super complex, super easy. That can be, I think, done in a whole bunch of different ways. Um, the, one of the things that we've talked a lot about and that I run into, especially with my students, is this idea that I am the font of knowledge and it is their job to sit and listen to me as I tell them everything they need to know. Um, and it, that's very difficult to push back against, in, especially in high stakes testing culture. Um, and it's, it's uh, independent thought I've found, especially as, more with my, as my students keep coming to me, is not often prized uh, at, at, at the lower levels. Uh, I don't want to make a universal generalization, but what I've found more and more is that my students are, are scared of making a mistake. And so they're scared to take ownership over the material. Mm -hmm. And so what I want to do is empower those students and to show them that um, asking questions and making mistakes is actually how we learn. And that's what historians do. We ask questions, we make mistakes, we admit what we don't know. Um, and so the student, uh, so what I've started doing is these student taught units um, where I set the idea of what the goal for the unit is, the events or materials that we need to be learned, and then I create guide sheets. So for instance, I did this with the Civil War. Um, and every student was assigned one event in the lead up to the Civil War. The big question of the course of that unit was what caused the Civil War? Uh, and then every student had to teach one major event and explain to the class how it contributed to rising sectional tensions and or the outbreak of war. What I do with these cheat sheets is I give them the information like, hey, if you're going to um, study a certain event, these are some th key terms you might want to include. Uh, I set guidelines for the format and the length of the lesson, and then for a week and a half, my students are running the classroom. And what I found is that students love this because one, they have very little homework to do in that unit. Uh, which, to be honest, at the high school level, these kids are swamped. Um, whether they're in a, a high stakes uh, environment where they're like, you know, taking seven SAT classes and, and playing three sports, or they're in a school, or they're in a school where you know they're working an after school job, or they're 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 doing childcare for younger siblings. And so what this does is it enables to, it takes some of that pressure off of the out of school time, um, and it allows them also to take ownership over the classroom. Many of my students are like. I don't know how you get up and do this every day. Um, but they were also like, oh man, I really know this material because I had to teach it. Uh, and I've done this at all levels. Um, I, I've done this in my senior elective where they actually set the questions for the course and we create the syllabi entirely off of their questions and they've taught several weeks of units. Um, and I see the ownership that they take over the classroom and I think that really helps prepare them for going into the college level where they're expected to take more and more ownership. Um, and they're always surprised that I would trust them to run the classroom, uh, which, I don't know quite why, but um, it's a lot of fun. All right, so the next and the last one is teaching historiography. This was my big goal this year, is to figure out how to teach historiography at the high school level. Um, and I think this is also something that can be expanded to be taught at the college level as well. What I really want students to understand is that there isn't just one master narrative of history. And so often it is very easy, especially um, in the curriculum that I'm working within, to present it that way. And I don't want to do that. I want them to understand that it's about competing arguments that are all rooted in evidence. Um, and so I compiled uh, a, a lesson on the American Revolution, 
where I gave them five excerpts, uh, brief excerpts of historians' explanation for why the American Revolution happened. And then I broke them up into groups. And again, I differentiated according to skill level. Um, so some of the more complex arguments I gave to my more uh, uh, sort of uh, advanced students, some of the, the little easier ones to understand I gave to ones who were a little bit less capable at that point uh, in the year. And then their job was to read that excerpt, and then I had guided reading questions. And this was the key thing about scaffolding. If these kids were, if these, my students were in college, I might not have included as many questions, but for the high school level, lots of guided reading questions. Then we came into class, and as a group, they got broke up into groups and discussed their historian's argument. Then they went up to the board and wrote the answer to the question, how did historian X explain the cause of the revolution? Then, as a class, we went over all of the explanations together. And we wrote down notes on, okay, so these are the five different explanations. The assignment for the unit was to then read the textbook and to answer the question, which historian is winning the historiographic debate in our textbook? And so what this asked them to do was to take their textbook and see it as an interpretation. That it's not one true story, but that it is actually an interpretation. And it was a lot of fun because at the end of the unit, we were like, okay, so who's winning, who's winning? And students were like, you know, they have to call me Dr. Bader. Um, they're like, you know, Dr. Bader, why should we care? I'm like, that's a great question. I was like, okay, let's look at it. Let's look at Bernard Balin's explanation of what caused the revolution. If we take that to be true, what's the story of the United States? And they're like, oh, you know, it's freedom and from tyranny. And I was like, right. Now, if we look at this brand new historian who's just argued that the reason why southern states actually uh, supported the revolution was because the um, British who were outlawing the Atlantic slave trade and the colonists were knew that slavery was going to be outlawed in the colonies. So that's why they rebelled and wanted to become an independent nation. If that's the reason for the American Revolution, what does the nation look like now? And they're all like, oh. <laughs> One student was actually like, that's not good. That is not good. And we talked about like, why is it that certain narratives get into the textbook and why others don't? And they were like, well, why isn't this newest one in there? I was like, well, let's look at the copyright of your textbook. And they're like, oh, it's three years old. I was like, yeah. So and we talked about when does historical uh, analysis make it into textbooks and how and why and the politics behind that. And, we, and you can do this with really any unit. I have the expert excerpts that I did up on, um, up on the blog, and you can use it with any textbook. The challenge is just getting that, those excerpts first. Um, and the AHA has fabulous historiographic uh, pamphlets that are like 10 or 12 pages long that you can grab to help you do that. So. Let me just briefly add that um, we've all put our assignments up on the blog. So the blog, especially if you're not the kind of person who can just memorize everything that people say to you and remember it, um, there all of the assignments with relevant links, with the do supporting documents that we use to actually do these things are on the blog. So you can can really get a sense of what we're doing in a pretty concrete way. Um, so as we've all discovered in our classrooms, there is a time for the teachers to stop talking um, and turn it over. So we'd like to, again, now invite all of you to discuss with each other, and not necessarily in the groups that you were in earlier, um, perhaps discuss with other people who are not in your cohort. Um, what are the assignments that have worked best for you in your classrooms? What are the biggest challenges you face at your particular level? What solutions have you come up with? Um, and how could these be adjusted for different levels, given um, what we've sort of come up with in terms of what we can expect from students at different levels. So, hi. Um, we would like you to share one, one assignment maybe from each group, is that okay? One assignment from each group? Okay. Um, any volunteers or should I start with the group that's most close to me? Volunteer? Love to hear about an assignment and then, and then we'll open it up for discussion I think, right? Yeah. Any volunteers? Two? No? <laughs> Hi. <laughs> no volunteers? No? Oh, here we go. Here we go. Thank you. Because I was going to say, oh, gosh, this is going to be like, gosh, it's like me doing stand up. <laughs> All right. Well, I have an assignment that I've done in. I guess two different classes, uh, the American Revolution and in an environmental history class. And basically the assignment is I take an ex, uh, um, um, I extract part of Thomas Jefferson's notes on the states of Virginia where he talks about race and ba basically he puts forward the, uh, the idea that African Americans are by nature to be, uh, designed to be slaves 
and they're slaves, so everything's working out just fine. And what I do is I take this, I type it up, uh, I shorten it so it fits on a single side of paper, and at the top I write um, something along the lines of, a colonist argues against a bill for emancipation 1782. And I hand it out and I ask the, the students, well, what ideas are there here? What does this have to say about either the revolutionary movement or ideas of nature and race, if it's the environmental history class? I ask them, what can we deduce about the author? You know, and they get, well, he's probably a white guy. He's probably very, fairly wealthy. He's making these arguments, so he's fa fairly educated. And then at the end, if they haven't figured out, and some students have read it before so they know, I reveal, well, this is the, you know, we hold these truths to be self-evident guy, and of course they have, to, they have to in some way reconcile these terribly racist things he's saying with the Declaration of Independence, with what else they know about Thomas Jefferson, and almost always makes an impact, and I've had actually a handful of students over the years come up to me afterwards and tell me that I have ruined Thomas Jefferson for them, <laughs> which isn't the goal, but at least it means that they're thinking critically about Jefferson, about the revolution, about ideas of race. Thank you. Um, would anyone else like to share? Would, would you mind coming up because it doesn't uh, stretch? There we'll get, get as close as you can. Okay, so um, I did a simulation this year where I was going to set up a debate about uh, whether or not we should impeach uh, James Polk for the um, Mexican War, um, and students had to uh, research their roles, John Calhoun, uh, John Quincy Adams, Abraham Lincoln, David Wilmot, Mariano Paredes, uh, Thomas Hart Benton, on and on. Um, so the students did this, and on the day of the debate, uh, they, they all gave their little canned presentations and they thought they were going into a debate and then I decided to create a crisis where um, Polk was assassinated um, and I actually had a student play Polk and she went to the bathroom uh, we set this up and um, so I, I, I came back I said what's wrong with you know what's wrong with Kari and, and so I came back and we, I said that, that Polk had been assassinated um, and so there were clues left behind and the clues were uh, a neatly folded page from the New Testament with Ephesians 6, 5 underlined, which lined up with Calhoun, uh, a Kickapoo arrowhead, perhaps dating back to the Black Hawk War, a cartoon cut from a newspaper and signed by David Wilmot, the July-August issue of the Democratic Review, um, a Mexican pistol, and a California gold nugget. And the students were then required, I said, there, are, there is a conspiracy in this room, and um, the conspirators are here among us, and they then had to decide what the conspiracy was, and they had to piece together three uh, conspirators with, um, that, that would have common reason to kill Polk, and they had to explain it in the out paper, which was the, the final paper. So it, it was a lot of fun, and um, the students enjoyed it, and they learned the material. I set all this up, of course, with um, a lot of attention to the Mexican War and uh, the aftermath of it, so that they had some broad sp perspective. So I, I returned to then, you know, Polk um, when we were sort of in the middle of the 1850s. So it, it worked really well this year. I was really proud of them. Yeah. That is very cool. Uh, <laughs> what about anyone from this group want to share an assignment or, or something concrete they do in their classes? <laughs> yeah, that's what tends to happen with me. Um, we just spoke in a more general sense about types of, you know, different types of methods and, you know, maybe some things that, that didn't work. Um, I know the one professor, she was talking about how sometimes her class it works and some, sometimes it doesn't, and she figured out it was because of a leader who was picked by a different professor for the choir, you know, for chorus, because she's a pro music professor. And I thought that was really interesting because students really do, they can change the dynamic of a classroom because every student is different and every student brings 
something different to the classroom. So no class is ever going to be the same. So it's a matter of really knowing your students and trying to figure out what works and what doesn't work for that specific classroom or maybe if it's a circumstance with a student, maybe just using the universal design for learning in lessons to kind of make sure everyone get the most out of what you're trying to teach them. Yeah, we would all, I think, second that, that you know, every class is gonna be different. So one thing that we talked about as a strategy to kind of approach that in a prepared way uh, was to maybe think about doing student self-assessments at the start of the, of the semester. How many history classes have they taken before? What are they hoping to get out of your class? You know, what do they think of primary sources, just inspired by the last panel I was in? Uh, so that, you know, you can, that way you can kind of uh, see where your students that you have this semester are coming from and can quickly tweak things if you need to so that it's not, you're just, you're not just waiting for that first big exam or that first big paper to see like, oh gosh, you're not where I thought you were. Uh, so that's, that's one thing that, that we thought people could do. Uh, what about this group? What were you guys talking? I know you're having a pretty uh, exciting discussion over here. So what sort of things were coming up in your group? Who are the kids who are advanced and who are the kids who we believe are not advanced? Uh, one of the things that uh, we do as, as pre-collegiate teachers, we're supposed to pick on the volunteers, you know, the kid that's mm -hmm. screaming out the answers, but also determine who's not participating and determining why they're not participating. Every once in a while, I get this situation where a kid is having problems or the kid who does not want to appear to be wrong. Mm -hmm. And Bob in indicated that a lot of times what we need to do is take the fear out of being wrong by assigning a writing, uh, a quick writing assignment and then having more and more people uh, speak about it and so you take the fear out of, uh, of challenging or, or asking a question and the kid is freezing. Now, for those of you who are teaching um, pre-collegiate, you know that when your supervisor comes in, he, wants, he or she wants you to identify those kids who are not participating and encouraging them by asking them questions and then going through a, a litany of routines and to, to draw them out. So my word, uh, some advice to the pre-collegiate teachers is that this is what you do when your supervisor comes in mm -hmm. and make it a practice of assessing on the quick why particular students are not participating in the class discussion. I think, can I add something too? I think on that, I want to second that note too, just um, the idea too, I, I hope it came across in the blueprint that when we're talking about things like deeper and advanced, though they remain vague <laughs> at the moment, we are, we are trying to talk about students' level of development and not uh, students' identity, right? The idea that there are good students or advanced students, I think can sometimes, if, if that's the approach that we take, we, we think of our students as, as fixed in a certain stage of their learning. And just to go on record that we, we really affirm that, that point that that's a level of development and not part of an identity. 
Yeah, and I think that's one of the things we would love to hear more about for the blog and for the, the blueprint that we put up there. Because, I mean, it was, it was something we were thinking about. What are the kinds of questions that you can expect an advanced seminar to answer versus what are the kinds of questions you can tackle with your first years? And, I, you know, I think it is absolutely something that we need to have in a more systematic and concrete way instead of just sort of going in with these loose expectations. Because once we have those expectations, we can be more transparent with our students and they can really understand what we're trying to accomplish. And I think a lot of, uh, I think better learning happens that way. embedded in your response to what good teaching should be. So the whole idea of starting with one primary source and you claim, the claim was that's what high school should be about. I suspect that should also be in a college classroom and a student doesn't have that kind of experience or hasn't mastered it. So, mm -hmm. so my comment is that the, the and I could be wrong because I heard five minutes of you know, the, 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 the presentation on it. So there was an implication, there's a set of assumptions that you may be making about learning in your respond to teaching mm -hmm. that was not true in your presentation on the tasks. All of those tasks were brilliant. I thought they were just stunning and could have been done at any level of instruction, mm -hmm. yeah. including first and second grade. Yeah. I've got some evidence of that. Yeah. But, so, but here's a suggestion I'm gonna to make to you. So I, I thought that the really exciting about this idea of ex exchanging tasks. Um, I wonder if you did an interesting design experiment which is that you all designed a task that could be taught in your classes and have the same essential yeah, prompt come back. Mm -hmm. Then what you do is exchange, not the prompt any longer, but mm -hmm. the papers. Mm -hmm. And then what you do is you co-read each other's papers. So that, you know, of course you're not gonna be reading, you don't wanna read all, all of the papers, but that you select three, you know, three categories. The ones that didn't quite seem to need it, the ones in the middle, the ones at the end and see if there really is uh, dramatic differences in the quality of the kinds of performances that you're doing. That might help the field produce a, a far better rubric yeah. on things yeah. like, for example, the, the claim that you made was that you know, the ones at the top, the, I think it was evidence was the, I can't remember what you had at the top, uh, these were the things that you should be focusing on. I wonder if that's actually true, that if, uh, for example, cause and effect you said was earlier, there's more sophisticated notions of cause that develop all the way mm -hmm. along the line. What would that mean? What would it look like? Mm -hmm. So I, it's just a suggestion that, yeah. that look at the learning rather than just the teaching. And I'm sure you're doing that, but the, then present on the learning, I think, would be really cool. No one ever presents how the students learn. That's why I love the, the two clips that you had from your students. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I would bet you that there are high school teachers in here that would have the same kind of reaction because their kids would be able to do the historiography that I thought mm -hmm. it was really cool. Thanks. Great stuff. Yeah, that's a great idea. We should do that. We'll do that. Yeah, I like that. Well, and our hope is next year to come back and, and to keep this going. But we're going to do course design stuff. stuff. Uh, and uh, so we've, because um, one of the things that we've found in doing this is that we don't want the project to stop. Um, and we want, we hope that all of you will join us online on Twitter and on our blog and making those comments, making those suggestions and getting involved in the project with us. We want to expand, like this isn't just about the four of us, but these are the four of us that we knew. Um, so we're really excited to keep doing that. And that's something that, you know, if you're like me and uh, Rebecca, we're Americanists. If you're an Americanist and you want to join in doing something like that, shoot us an email and, and that could be something we could do and that could be really fun. So, and then um, Natasha and, and Megan are Europeanists, so same thing. Right, so we are also in desperate need of people who don't do European and American history. <laughs> yes. Not to pretend that the field is evenly split between those two things. So, um, yes, we'd love to hear from people who teach African history, Asian history, so on. Uh, what about this group? What, what, were you guys bringing up any sort of general issues as well as the specific assignments? Did anything just come up in your conversation? I know if I can put you on the spot, I know you were talking about how important it is to you as a student to feel like you have a certain amount of freedom. So would you mind recapping that for the? Um, one, one of the points that I like that I'd made was that in terms of how a teacher lays out their lesson plan at any level, it doesn't really 
for me personally matter as long as I'm given the creative license to make an argument mm -hmm. about the time period, provide evidence myself, and then as long as I'm arguing it in a clear, concise, coherent manner that's backed up by credible evidence, then that's, that's the whole point. So for an example, I had a World War II history class which the standard narrative of World War II obviously is that it's it started in 1939 and ended in 1945. But after learning and going through the class, one can really stand to argue, well, could World War II have really started in the early 30s when Japan invaded Manchuria? And, and that's where I was like, that's what I want to write about. Went to the professor, he was like, yeah, of course you can write about that. Went through the research, found credible evidence, and I wrote a paper about how the war could really be argued that it started in the early 30s and not in the late 30s. And that for me was more of a paper than anything else that I could have really wrote because the teacher gave me the ability to argue something myself. So I took, like they, like they have been argued, um, when you give the student the ability to take control over what they're learning and sort of take personal pride and ownership in their, they'll, they'll invest themselves. So instead of having a paper that it was more of a task to write, I enjoyed it and then I was having fun researching it and coming up with my own argument so that at the end I have a paper that was uniquely mine and isn't sort of like this general idea of like these are the three things that you can write about and then the, pa the teacher's just reading something that's been regurgitated by students throughout the years that's just the same evidence used for the same conclusion. So really, as long as the student can, can be given the opportunity to make their information and make their papers and make their research their own. I feel like that puts them more in touch with be, being in a history major for the historian purpose and not just sort of learning about history, like exploring it for yourself, which for me is, is what makes it, you know, is what makes it interesting and what it should be about. And so this is something that, that I've tried to do in the last few years is to build in choices on any assignment that I make. And, and invariably, the most boring uh, papers that I have to read are those papers where I don't ask a good question. Yeah. And um, even on a daily basis, presenting students with choices. It's super easy to do now you know, with, you know, with, with all of this information that's digital that I can build this into my classes on a daily basis. And it, it you know, it's, it's liberating for the student, it's liberating for me as well. Thank you. No, I, I completely agree. We are unfortunately out of time, so what I will do now is just draw your attention to uh, this slide over here, which has our blog address and our Twitter handle. We would love to hear from all of you. You have awesome ideas. Um, and if you'd like to get in touch with us, these are our email addresses. Uh, if you signed up on the email sheet that we are passing around, we'll email all that information to you so you don't need to frantically copy it down. Uh, and if you do want to sign up uh, on the email sheet, then that is up at the front. But thank you all so much for coming to the last session of the conference. Uh, and have a wonderful rest of the week and safe travels. So thank you very much. Thank you.